salary, so we all are interested in the subject that we pursue. So there is always a bias because you're driven by your interest. And so you can't disambiguate these things. Um, so I'm going to go first and talk about some of the history, the present research, and what I think is in incredibly exciting, some of the, the newest innovations that we're seeing right now coming out of the soul side space. So we have echoes from archaeology. We have the Tisili cave art from northern Algeria 7,000 years ago. Um, we have the Mesoamerican mushroom stones, you know, from 1500 to 2000, or from 1500 AD to 500 BCE. And then we have the interesting relief of uh, Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom before she goes into the underworld. It's very interesting to me that the, in Greek mythology with Demeter and Persephone, it coincides with the Mesoamerican mushroom stones. All of these, though, are tenuous because we have to interpret them. It's very, very difficult to wind back the clock to understand what these actual, actual uses were. So we do have some very good recordings because the priest Sahagun in the 1500s uh, traveled to Spaniards in part of the conquest and terrible tragic history. But from this, these reports were written down of the use of magic mushrooms. Now, I find it most curious that virtually the same time, 1529, and in 1516, in Bavaria, the Bavarian Beer Purity Act banned <laughs> mushrooms from beer. Then you look at this, this silly cave art is a bee band, or a figure that looks like a bee that's covered with mushrooms. So the use of putting mushrooms in honey, even in Mesoamerica today, and the long held tradition in Europe, I think led to psychoactive means, and to brews, concoctions, and protecting the mushrooms from bacteria and insects, you put it into honey, that was a preservation attempt, and doing so created a long-term psychedelic um, elixir. So the credit we must give is to Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina befriended, befriended uh, our Gordon Wasson and Valentina Wasson. But Valentina Wasson, uh, uh, Maria Sabina is a Mazatec shaman, and I report to present that she was also a mycologist. She went out into the woods, she collected magic mushrooms, she knew which ones to collect, which ones to avoid, and because of her mycological wisdom, collecting these sacraments and bringing them to Barb Gordon and Valentina Wasson, she befriended them and passed on the sacred knowledge, which is the message from the mushrooms. You want to share this experience because it's helpful for everyone. Valentina Wasson was a true mycologist, not Barb Gordon Wasson. Valentina was a Russian doctor. She was schooled in Latin binomials. She knew how to collect the mushrooms. Our Gordon Watson was very mycophobic. She was very mycophilic. They coined those two terms because of the dialectic of their views from their cultures towards mushrooms. But it's these great women mycologists, Maria Sabina, Valentina, and Valentina Watson, they really passed the torch and brought this you know, sacred medicine you know, to the forefront some of the experiences that we have today. So there's over 5,682 collections of psilocybin active mushrooms since the 1800s. They're circumpolar all around the world. The only reason why the parts of Africa is not well populated is because there were not collections made, not because they don't grow in those areas. Obviously, the Sahara Desert, they don't. But the Tisili Cave Art from the Tisili Anajar Plateau literally translates to the plateau of running rivers. It was much moisture there than climate change in the Sahara Desert you know, increased. Nevertheless, psilocybin mushrooms cross cultures, continents, and centuries. Psilocybin mushrooms join us together. There's no doubt that we all came from Africa. I mean, how can anyone seriously dispute that? We all originated from Africa, we moved into Europe, then we populated the rest of the world. And with that migration of humans, we carried knowledge and technologies to share with our friends. And these technologies, if they increase your ability to deal with life, you know, there's an advantage. It's a gift, it's a benefit that you want to confer onto a friend. So I, my brother John, who went to Yale, he brought back this book. On break. I was 14 years of age, and he lent me this book, All the States of Consciousness, which I devoured. Right? 
I went to my best friend Ryan, and Ryan took it. And they, I tried to get it back from Ryan. My brother had to go back to Yale. And Ryan kept on avoiding the issue. I said, Ryan, I need my book back, my brother's book. And he goes, and then eventually he broke down and he said, I cannot give you the book, Paul. I said, why? He says, my father found it and burned it. I said, your father burned my brother's book? And I was in really hot water with my elder brother. But Ryan's father was an authoritarian, and he didn't like the idea of the son changing his consciousness. So I'd like to take lemon and make lemonade, and I thought, well, that's so inspired. Ryan's father to burn this book, and I definitely found something that I'm very interested in. <laughs> so, and this began, and so I started studying psilocybin mushrooms. I published my first book on psilocybin mushrooms 45 years ago. That is how long I've been involved in I started off in 18 and 19, um, and then I published it around, around 21 years of age. So, um, and here's my brother John and my mother when I gave him on that day when the book came out. My mother was a charismatic Christian, but she still loved her son. Um, my brother John was like, this is really cool. My younger brother is really into this. And so, I want to give honor to my father, my mother, my brother John sadly passed away. And they, you know, they were huge mentors in my life in, in their own regards. And I want to also acknowledge my teachers. This is uh, Daniel Stuntz, who opened up his library at the University of Washington's uh, botany department in the mycology lab. Kit Skates, another incredibly influential mycologist in North America. Michael Hugh and Dr. Alexander Smith. The species named after Dr. Stuntz is Lonsby Sinsii. Alexander Smith wrote a monograph on the genus Solosophy. Michael Bue was my professor at the Edinburgh State College, and we received a TEA license in 1977-1978. So I could legally possess and cultivate all seven mushrooms, which meant that every other person approached me, I thought they were a TEA undercover agent. <laughs> they were so excited. So I bought the, 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 the average, nature provides I come. I take this quite seriously. When you give soul seven mushrooms to another person, it's a very, very potent medicine. You have a responsibility for their safety, their welfare, and their mental health. I'm not a therapist. I'm a mycologist. So I don't want to take the risk of injury or passing on something so powerful about the dark rails to be able to protect the individual, individual to maximize their benefit. So I went on to publish four new species, Psilocybe azurescens, putatively the most potent psilocybin from the species in the world. Solosky Miniformis variety Americana, Solosky Sanoficulosa, and Solosky Wiley Light, named after Dr. Andrew Weil. So, let's see if this works. <laughs> well, we go to manual. Yeah, it worked. Oh, it did work. Great. So, Solosky mushrooms have spores that turn our purple brown in color. In taxonomy of the mushroom, spore color is a primary feature at the genus level. So one of the first things us mycologists will ask is what color are the spores? So you can think of spore print. And the spores germinate. Oops, let's go back one. This is not working as fast as I can. Okay. So this is the growth of mycelium over five days. Wow. It's an extraordinarily rapid growth. And then the mycelium channels nuclei which stream through the hyphae, the cellular networks, and convey information. And because the network-like design of the mycelium and the epigenesis is able to adapt to change, and these are oftentimes interface runners running at the edge of habitats that are in transition from storms, from disasters, hurricanes, from you building a house. And so many of these psilocybin mushrooms follow human activity. And then under the right conditions, a drop of temperature, introduction of light, which is surprising, water, and then as the mycelium comes up and it exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, that triggers mushrooms to form for the mycelium forming primordia. And then literally in a few days, four to five days from the primordial stage to mature mushrooms. And many people in this audience are quite familiar with this life cycle. But I'm gonna show and this audio may or may not work, so I'll narrate over it. So 
this is a species of Psilocybe, Psilocybe azurescens, and this is a wild patch in Washington State. And these were quite large. And they have a sinuous stem, and they have these, the bruises bluish very readily, even from raindrops. And so this is the largest wood chip inhabiting psilocybin mushroom um, in North America. And it naturalizes into a deciduous woodlands, and you had wood chips. It was the advent of landscaping of wood chips that propelled the psilocybin mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest into the viewscape of mycologists. Prior to beauty park and landscaping wood chips, these psilocybin mushrooms were rarely ever seen. Even Dr. Daniel Stuntz had never seen many of the species until the wood chips were put around the universities, around churches, around law enforcement facilities. <laughs> and these psilocybin mushrooms have a sense of humor. Uh, so, but this is a very potent species, very high in psilocybin and psilocin. Now, psilocybin is a prodrug for psilocin. And so these, another species is Psilocybe cyanescens. These are called wavy caps. Uh, they also grow in wood chips. These are much more common. And these grow in riparian zones, typically on the coastal regions of British Columbia, uh, Western Washington, Western Oregon, down there in South San Francisco. But this is the, the other species, Psilocybe cubensis, the most commonly consumed psilocybin mushroom, Psilocybe cyanescens, is, uh, is the second most common consumed psilocybin mushrooms in the Northwest. And then another species that you'll see are called Liberty Caps, Psilocybe simulonciata. I like showing movies because rather than these still images, you get a sense of the mushroom in situ in the ecosystem. Um, and it's just a great pleasure to have these, you know, growing in, in the natural environment near you. Psilocybe simulonciata, Liberty Caps, is very high in psilocybin, very low in psilocin. So when psilocin degrades, it turns into a bluing reaction that's associated with it. Psilocybin did not brew, uh, mushrooms that are high in psilocybin, like Liberty Caps, do not bruise bluish. Cyanescence and azurescence and cubensis do bruise bluish. The stronger the bluing reaction, the more potent it once was. So the bluing reaction itself is pharmacologically uh, not, it does not, you know, cause intoxication. So this is a Liberty Cap pasture. They typically grow near ponds, and they grow up to the grass. Now, if they're sheep or cows uh, or other ruminants, then that enhances their proclivity. But they're sort of hard to see, but they grow in grass, and then you can, when you find them, um, they grow in these gregarious clusters, and they have a little nipple at the very top of the cap, the papilla. And so even though the species is not bruised bluish, it is an easy one to identify for people who are fairly familiar with the species once they learn. So a rule that's about 95% accurate is that if a mushroom has a purple rock spore print, and it bruises bluish, it's almost for certain a psilocybin mushroom. So, but Seminacieta does not bruise bluish, and, but. My brother, you guys, I truly apologize for interrupting, but I feel so bad, and you put so much time in effort in presentation, it deserves to have audio. Uh -huh. We're not gonna fail you, but we're gonna fix the problem, okay? No, it's, it's, sorry, it's okay, because I, I'm, I'm managing by the second, so, listen, Art, you've done a great job. Come on, come on, gonna hit the button. Hey, okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's two buttons now moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the organizers for more time. <laughs> Okay, since I had a DEA license and coverage for it, we started doing some psilocybin mushroom conferences in the 1970s. 
1979, this is in Washington, Vermont, this is in Florence, Oregon. Um, and even though we were in there, it was much different situations out there, many of you people of my age know, we were under persecution for the anti-war movement, the, the making psilocybin a schedule one substance was really targeting uh, ethnic minorities, especially African Americans who were smoking a pot, the jazz scene in New Orleans, you know, the divorce of a lot of pot, the scene was happening. And the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, the women's rights movement, the First Nation Native American movement, the, you know, Nixon bundled us all together and then using the, the illegality of psychedelics and marijuana in order to weaponize us, put us, you know, politically at a disadvantage. So because I had a license, I was able to, to get psilocybin mushrooms. And I went on to publish, you know, I have seven books, six of books um, are on cover psilocybin mushrooms, but it was Terrence McKenna's book up there on the upper right, Psilocybin Magic Mushrooms Warrior's Guide, that became the most popular. And this really just swept, especially over the west coast of the uh, United States and British Columbia and parts of Europe. So these conferences continued. In 1998, there was Sasha Shulman and Ann Shulman, and, and there was uh, 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 Albert Hoffman and myself and, and others that you're familiar with. And so in a sense, these, this conference here is a continuation of the thread of knowledge that we are passing this knowledge forward. Now it's more robust and there's less chance of knowledge to get lost because there's such a shared intelligence network that's been created to study psilocybin. By far the most fun conference was 1999, the Millennium Mushroom Conference. A good friend of Ken Kesey and her pranksters, for those of you who know about like, the passive cooling test, etc. I knew the psychedelic scientists and I knew some of the psychomotic cultural heroes. So we brought them together for this amazing magical mushroom conference. And I totally lost control of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> but Slashi Kansas, which grows right near here in Florida, this is the species that's most common. It also grows on elephant dung. It grows in India, it grows in the Philippines, it grows in South America, Central America. You know, it grows circumpolar all over the world in India. So this is the species that we think originated from Africa. And then the species then came over to the Americas and then with the conquistadors when they brought uh, over cattle. Maria Sabina used Slavski Zappa to form. She did not use Slavski Kibetsa. She's the stain. So 95% of the people who are using psilocybin mushrooms in the surveys that we've done is with Slavski Kibetsa. So I'm going to go over some of these surveys. These are meta surveys, but I think these are significant. 480 85,000 prisoners were surveyed, one time use of psilocybin, statistically significant odds and reduction, largely in theft, property crime, or a violent kill. Think about that. Psilocybin is associated with reduction of crime. Psilocybin use is also associated with the reduction of partner partner violence. 16, 1,266 people were surveyed in this. And only psilocybin is associated with reduction in intimate partner-partner violence. I always thought I'd get a dating app, you know, that check, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then an association with psychedelics and opioid use disorder in a national representative survey, a more recent study here. And this is 214,000 people. Psilocybin is the only psychedelic, not MDMA, not LSD, not masculine, only psilocybin was associated with reduction in opioid use. And then nature relatedness. People who did psilocybin, you know, increase their empathy and interest in protecting nature and the environment, okay. and becoming better Earth citizens. So psilocybin sort of stands out here. And then now we have peer-reviewed double-blind placebo controlled studies, and many of you are familiar with these. And now that we see the soul side of the very favorably, even better, the most commonly used antidepressant drugs. A more recent study that came out, started in 2016, I believe, shows a statistically a significant reduction in binge drinking. So this is now, you look at these meta surveys, you can say association is not causation, but it informs physicians on how to design clinical studies. So we see a reduction here significantly in binge alcohol use with people who are, who are using alcohol. 
This is important. This is very significant when you think about the cost of society, the alcoholism, the opioids, part and part of violence. A narrative is building here and is helping the physicians inform on what they can do in designing clinical studies. I checked this morning. It was two days ago, 116 out of 118 clinical trials on suicide. Let us show that. Clinical trials are not done. These are not They have to meet several criteria. They address an urgent need that's not currently being addressed by conventional medicines. That it, it, it is, will likely do no harm. It's scalable. It's practical. And it solves how it checks each one of those boxes. So niacin is used opposite psilocybin in 11 of those studies. Now, I am concerned about this because those of you who have been studying the subject of using psilocybin against depression and giving up placebo, I have not seen one study yet look at the increase in causing depression because 20 minutes later, when you get out of the placebo, if you got that, and you had a niacin flush, you knew you did not get the medicine you were urgently wanting to get. Right. So the physicians are actually exacerbating the, the severity of depression by not disambiguating the influence of the second setting and the placebo they're giving. Right. So there's a lot of discussion now that placebos are not relevant for high-dose psilocybin studies. Because every a placebo becomes no placebo in 20 minutes. A true placebo should be neutral, where the patient cannot detect that they got the placebo. Anyone who has taken niacin knows you know, so this is an unfortunate there's 11 clinical studies using high doses of niacin as a positive and CO control, which is obviously, I think, a huge problem uh, for the recent state. So looking at the abuse potential of psilocybin, those of us, I mean, I, I can't believe I'm going to ask this question, but how many people in this room have not taken psilocybin?
Um, and how much are you taking? And are you stacking it? Are you using lion's mane, niacin, using something else? And uh, and pre-formulated, then you have challenge tests: memory, vision, audio cues. It's about you know, 70 tests. We have a version two now that just came out that is all of the validated tests of physicians and psychiatrists use to measure uh, your neurological health. So we these tap tests stood out. Because many of the tests are subjective. How do you feel? I feel better. You know, <laughs> it's very subjective. I want to know, is there something that would not relate to expectancy? And we found something. And we put it in there, and it's called the finger tap test. Now, there's no expectancy or placebo that can cloud the results here. It's how many times can you tap your fingers um, in 10 seconds, alternating? And so the microdosers, as they started, now the amazing thing, we got more non-microdosers, 4,500 people, than 4,300 microdosers. So to understand microdosing, it's non-intoxicating. 10, 10 a, a gram of Slosky Cubensis is about 10 milligrams at 1, 1%. So you run one-tenth of a gram of Slosky Cubensis, which is about one milligram. And 88% of the responders are in that one to three milligram range, which is one tenth or one third of a dry celestial defenses. The majority of them microdose three to five times a week. 10% of the people in the study were using uh, Slosky Mexicana, uh, Tampanesis Armandia. These are legal in, in, in uh, uh, Holland, um, and they're, they're known as truffles, that's probably this name. Uh, because of a loophole, you know, they were able to sell, still sell these even today. So, but 90% of people were using Slosky Commences. Um, and there's two microdosing studies, or protocols, the Jim Gladden protocol, day one, you dose, two days off, day four, you dose. And then a protocol I made up, which is four to five, day, uh, four to five days on, uh, and then, um, and then, and then, and then, uh, two days off. So you're basically the week, the week, work week, you're going in, and the week ends with taking off. Now, Jim and I are work friends. I asked him, how do you come up with your protocol? I go, I just made it up. <laughs> I did too. But, Me too. But we both believe that you need to rush the receptors to renormalize so you can be resensitized. And you don't become, you know, adapted and dependent upon the, the microdose. So I talked to our assistant staff, which is a combination of psilocybin, lion's mane, and vitamin B3, the flushing form, nicotinic acid. I came up with this in 2014-2015. Now, lion's mane is a very well studied. Uh, there's several clinical studies on it. The mycelium of the lion's mane produces aeronaceans that causes regeneration of myelin um, on the nerves. You know, psilocybin, beautifully at that time, was not known. I thought it would be neurogenically beneficial. And then niacin, because psilocybin is a vasoconstrictor, niacin is a vasodilator. So neuropathies oftentimes present themselves the deadening of the fingertips and the toes at the extremities and vasoconstriction. So I thought if we had vasodilation, overcoming vasoconstriction from psilocybin, develop these neuro neurogenic agents to the endpoints of the peripheral nervous system, that could be beneficial. That was my hypothesis. So little did I know that I stumbled onto something. Maybe this is my tripping on psilocybin, my <laughs> but I came up with this. And um, this has been a long road, folks. This has been eight or nine years with this concept. And so I just quickly are showing there's lots of good studies on Lion's Mane. Go to mushroomreferences.com. It's over a thousand pages long right now for physicians, our physicians and researchers. You can Google, you know, Lion's Mane or neuropathies or Alzheimer's or cancer. And you can find all the peer reviewed articles on there. So please, you know, pass that. It's unbranded, it's just it's pure, pure science. So lion's mane is well studied. So what we, in so lion's mane mycelium contains this compound called aranaceans that the mushroom fruit bodies do not. So the aranaceans are very, very potent in their neurogeneration properties. This is why lion's mane mycelium is far superior to, to uh, mushroom, the mushroom fruit bodies in lion's mane. Wow. Fruit bodies have no aranaceans and the mycelium codes for those. So we started doing this research, and because we had the TAP test that was so significant, you know, I asked my colleagues, well, how can we figure out, you know, what is happening with the TAP test? Now, we published this in Nature. This is a data set of 3,486 people. 
Um, and the stack, the nice, nice and nice many of the cells had mushrooms, was by far the most popular stack. I was on Joe Rogan, so a lot of people get excited about this. Um, and so we uh, published this article, and we got the results back. And these were done validated tests on psychiatrists used. Yes, we had a, 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 an increase in mood, uh, beneficially, a decrease in depression and anxiety. But the skeptics will say that's expectancy. I'm microdosing, you're microdosing, we're all microdosing together, don't we feel great? <laughs> yes, we have a community. All right, well, you can't have expectancy enhancing a placebo of that, you can have expectancy enhancing a drug. That's when you go to a doctor, you expect the doctor will give you something. That expectancy added effect helps the medicines work better, as well known by physicians. So we published our second study in nature, uh, this is this past year, and this is more really looking at cause and effects and more of a vertical analysis. The first one's more demographic and you know, the motivation is why people are doing it. But this is more results oriented. And we've also reaffirmed the antidepressant, uh, anti-anxiety, but then the tap test stuck out. And my fellow researchers did not want to share this with my partner, who was a physician and I, for several weeks, almost two months, that they attacked the data. They could not believe what they saw. Microdosing with psilocybin or non-microdosers had no increase in the TAP test in 30 days. But when we looked at the 55 plus year olds, we got a signal that was astonishing. Neurodegeneration occurs, obviously age related, and that you can't run as fast when you're older, you can't play the piano as well, you are suffering neurodegeneration as a consequence of age. Exacerbated by diseases, not by viruses that are neurotoxic, neuroinflammatory, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diseases that we don't know the causes, even today. So the fact that these 55 plus year olds were able to tap, you know, uh, so much more frequently, from 48 uh, taps to 60, uh, 68 in 30 days, speaks to a single motor skill that has, I believe, was because neurons were being regenerated. That was a hypothesis. So then we thought, okay, what could be the mechanism of action? So we started looking at map kinases. These are proteins that when they're activated, uh, they dock on the outside of the cell and they transfer to the nucleus. And we look at track A, B, and C. These are the, the, the nerve growth factors and BDNF, brain drive neurotrophic factors, dock on these receptor proteins on the cells. When they lock into them, then these nerve growth factors then stimulate the signal to the nucleus, and then nerves and the cells begin to regenerate. They begin to create new neurons. So we focused on these, these uh, MAP receptors because it's a very well established uh, method for looking at preclinical drugs that relates to neurogeneration. Then we started getting the data. So here's psilocin and niacin, the predicted additive zone you see there, blue and red. We stacked them together. We got activation of 4.8 and 6, 6 point, you know, uh, plus times more synergy activating these receptors than we did with other components by themselves. So we started looking at, okay, we look like lion's mane, psilocin, and niacin. And here we just start our minds were being blown. And this is at basically, um, so Erickson, Macy, psilocin, and niacin had no activity in those receptors. You put them together, and there's a new term of work to me called maximum calculable value. When three components have no activity, the three put together have massive, massive activity. And so this, these nerve growth factors that are now stimulating, uh, that are blocking, causing nerves to grow, this is like, okay, now we're starting to see something here that's interesting. So we started looking at different concentrations. And we had synergistic effects of 14x, 9.5. When we looked at some of the psilocybin analogs that are not illegal, they don't get you high, but they also are co-occurring in the mushrooms. 99.999% of the people using psilocybin are using psilocybin mushrooms. And yet virtually all, with the exception of three clinical studies that have been published so far, are in psilocybin the molecule. Right. There's a big disconnect between science and real world use. That's why we're interested in these other associated tryptamines. So we start looking at other track, uh, not K receptors, track B, which actually codes for generating newborn neurons and stem cells in the hippocampus. 
thought to be impossible. And this speaks to neuroplasticity. So BDNFs are also with this combination uh, showing this extraordinary synergy of the entourage effect. So if we look at norcilacin and nicotinic acid and lion's mane fraction for JAK1s, and this is related to anti-inflammatory, because usually we have cell division, you have inflammation at the same time. The fact that we are able to stimulate these anti-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 10s and 1RAs, but uh, bundled with neurogeneration, that's medically very, very interesting. You can grow new cells without having a pro-inflammatory response, also implicated for antivirals. So how many of these do I have oh, for the capital of the virus? I have hundreds. I have spent more than a million dollars on the data that we have that you see. I have hundreds of these. So let me just emphasize this. There's an enormous amount of cross-talking here. So you normally have binaries and ternaries, two together, three together, but they're also communicating across the neurological ecosystem. So we have an entourage effect of all this cross-talking and all these different pathways that are coming together. So we said, okay, let's see if this actually works in vitro. So we took medulla adrenal cells, and then we exposed them to these different compounds and fractions, and sure enough, we were able to get statistically significant increase in the radial growth of brain neurons in a feature dish. So this is a linear figure. All of you know the area of circles is pi r squared. And when you increase the radius, you substantially increase you know, the, the volume of cells. So we were able to show this in vitro. So I'm going to go back. So we have three pillars of evidence here that are highly suggestive. We have the, the CAP test data. Hard to, to discount that. We have the MAP kinases, hundreds of examples of synergy, of maximum calculable value where the individual components have no activity, but combined they have, MAP, they have massive activity. We have in vitro. So this has been substantial enough for us to move forward to clinical studies. For the bottom hypothesis, and this is a hypothesis, folks. I am standing here on stage and let, let you know we need to clinically prove this. But this is emerging as a potential breakthrough in medicine. And so these are my hypotheses, and the entourage effect of the lion's mane and multiple tryptamines enhances the neurogenic factors of these of these compound of these compounds in isolation or together. So let's talk very quickly, I have four minutes and thirty-three seconds left. Uh, there's adverse effects, possible causes. Okay, you can all read this, I don't need to read them. But I want you to Understand, let's go back one. The difference in growth in the mushrooms in the foreground and the mushrooms in the background can be six hours. When spores are produced, their asthmatic children are, really, are allergic to sloths and cubans of spores, 100%. Asthmatic children become asthmatic adults. A good friend of mine's wife died in his arm from an asthma attack this past year. So all of you should be concerned about this. You should be picking them, picking the mushrooms pre-pubescently before spores form. So this is a big one. Physicians, please photograph this, this slide. Send it to skeptics, send it to physicians. It's a concern about virulopathy and fenforamine. Fenfen docks with a 5-HC2B receptor and was taken off the market because it caused heart valve malformation and damage. So many physicians are saying, well, microdosing could they increase the risk of volumopathy. So we started, I have five PhDs full-time on staff. I said, let's dig into the literature here. And this is a story in progress. But I want to point out that the half-life of psilocybin is 1.8 hours. You do a, a half-life calculator, in 24 hours, you're between 1, 500 to 1,000 of the dose. Fenfloramine's half-life is 20 hours, which means you've got most of it there. And then still in microdosing is one milligram five times per week, that's five milligrams per week. And then me is twice per day, 14 milligrams, 196 milligrams per week. And moreover, serotonin docks with 5-H2B. So serotonin and psilocin are about the same, and they're docking on the 5 h the same receptor. So it's not the docking, it's what happens beyond the cell wall. And so with our kinase information, the newest data that we have, it crosses the cell wall membrane and a calcium uh, redux ion pathway and elicits what's called beta arrestin, 
which then modulates the G protein so you don't get overstimulation of the nerves, which means it's working. So this is a, a big milestone in our research. But this is very important, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a work in progress, but we need to really keep this in perspective that if we're gonna be concerned about myelopathy with psilocybin, we better be concerned with serotonin, which is your major transmitter that you're using all the time. Okay, so the last four or five slides here. The most popular way, as most of you know, of the delivery system is you mix up your microdosing in chocolate, the Astax Thomas this, thank you, Astax. Um, and then you can have them um, easily to access, I recommend you put the word laxative on the chocolate. <laughs> I speak from experience, it's not the laxative side of experience. And the people think, oh, these are red chocolates, I'll eat three or four of these, right? So, but a recent poll just came out, and one out of four adults over the age of 65 want to microdose. They're seeing their friends experience dementia, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative decline, but there's a huge unmet need. So, and looking at what the potential is for psilocybin macrodosing, followed by microdosing, which is very popular, it can regenerate neurons. I believe psilocybin makes nicer people. I believe psilocybin can treat addiction. I believe that psilocybin can reduce violence. I believe psilocybin can make us smarter people. We're losing a body in a lush of literally the um, greatest signs of star error are dying and going through dementia at a time critical they need to pass on this information. I want to acknowledge the, the 11 full-time researchers we have on staff. We have 77 peer reviewed papers. <laughs> We are losing Einsteins every day due to neurodegeneration. This has become the zeitgeist of our times, the use of psilocybin mushrooms. This is a people's revolution. We know that they're sick. We know they can fundamentally treat some of the most severe diseases. And if we can improve the neurological health of all of us to become better or citizens at a time critical, that if we need to have inventions and creativity from the people bringing solutions forward. So I, I urge all of you, you know, go forward with optimism, kindness, reach out your hand, give hugs. We're all in this worship together. It's our time to make our descendants proud that our ancestors from all over the world are calling out to us that it is so important that our actions and our solutions today that are literally control the future of not only human population, but biodiversity on this planet. We can do this. We can do this together. All of you are involved. I want to thank you very much.